Well, good morning, everybody here from Sydney, um, early in the uh, Thursday morning. Welcome to uh, our November edition of the Brandwood CKC live webinar series. Um, I was uh, attending the Asian Harmonization Working Party in Oman last week. Um, and had the privilege of sitting on a panel there in a discussion about the changing face of regulation. One of the key themes that came out was how regulation is becoming much more iterative, much more cooperative with the advent of new technologies, new ways of making devices, regulators and manufacturers and other stakeholders are talking to each other more and more um, with the aim of de-risking the processes with the aim of doing things better um, for an outcome of better devices that perform better, that are safer. Today, I'm very excited. We have a, a guest um, speaker. We have um, uh, Cisco, Francisco Vicente, Cisco, uh, is going to speak to us. Uh, he's from the FDA. Um, he's going to talk to us about the Case for Quality. Um, the Case for Quality is a program developed um, under the auspices of the Medical Device Innovation Consortium in the US, where a bunch of stakeholders, manufacturers, um, US FDA, the industry, um, and others have partnered to identify practices um, in, in manufacture and design that lead to higher quality. Um, it's been underway for several years now. I think there are 18 companies and 51 facilities that undergo a periodic assessment um, focused on practices that go above and beyond, that advance the quality. Um, now, Cisco is um, the lead at FDA. Cisco comes from a background where he knows a thing or two about quality. He spent some part of his career in the semiconductor, semiconductors industry um, in manufacturing and working uh, for, for Big Blue, for IBM in the microelectronics business unit. Um, and then he moved to FDA uh, where he joined the uh, cardiac rhythm and electrophysiology branch um, in CDRH. Um, he's also been branch chief of the respiratory ENT general hospital and ophthalmic devices branch and of, uh, in the division of manufacturing quality and the office of compliance. So um, uh, an experienced um, expert speaker today um, and I'm going to, at this point, hand over to Cisco and, and uh, say welcome and thank you for joining us this morning. You're going to tell us all about the case for quality, Cisco. Thank you, Arthur, for the introduction and, uh, and Brandwood, really, for the opportunity to really get out to the audience and share a lot of what we've been doing from an FDA standpoint and where we'd like to go. So let me actually see if I can switch over to some other slides here. And get that rolling. Uh, are you guys able to see my slides? Fine, we can see that very clearly. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. All right, we will go through that now. I'm actually going to stop sharing the video for a little bit until that gets up and running and go through that. All right, so I really wanted to take the opportunity here to talk about our case for quality, um, what the program is, where we'd like to go with it, what we've done, um, some of the rationale why we did this, and then you know open up the questions afterwards. So with that, let's see here. So a lot of this really was founded with our overarching vision, right? It's really that patients in the U.S. have access to high quality, safe, effective medical devices of public health importance first in the world. Um, it's always what we want to be driving everything back to, and that's really allowed us to rethink and recast what it is that it means to have this uh, oversight role, this regulatory uh, authority that we actually employ with our industry. Here is just a slide that I think really tries to tell the story of what we are dealing with when we talk about uh, the oversight of the device space. You know, from an agency standpoint, uh, I think as you can see, there is an overwhelming volume of manufacturers, both domestically and internationally. Um, as much as you know, we do get extra support from the industry through our user fees for the staff, it's still 1,800 people to oversee this on an annual basis. With that, I think we were still seeing 
repeated issues. We see the same repeated non-compliance activities coming up over and over again. We see recalls occurring for similar issues, sometimes repetitive recalls for things that we thought should have been addressed or were addressed. So in 2011, the FDA did launch the uh, case for quality effort. Really, it was a initiative structured to mitigate those risks right, by transitioning away from just focusing on compliance and trying to really drive and prioritize product quality and patient outcomes. We did that really through developing what is this collaborative effort. Um, MDIC, which is a medical device innovation uh, consortium, it is a public-private partnership that really enabled us to bring in all stakeholders in the healthcare ecosystem. So we're talking payers, providers, the patients who are uh, a big part of the community we're serving, the uh, medical device manufacturers, um, other regulators, with the whole goal of improving patient safety and outcomes, um, but really driving, um, implementing changes and incentivizing the design and manufacture of high quality medical devices. The program, as it started, has as it's really continued, has focused on three key areas right now. One being our voluntary improvement program, which is structured to really tackle the barrier of driving the focus away from just compliance to a more quality-driven mindset. Um, enhanced data and analytics. How do we get better information? How do we really start to understand what is happening throughout the whole life cycle of the product? And then the last piece of it, because this is something that is critically important as a regulator, we are very much part of that system. And that system is only going to really be able to move or function or improve um, in accordance to whatever it's constrained, constrained by. So we have to be um, a lot more agile. We have to be more responsive. We have to be more data-driven to help accelerate that safety and innovation focus. So, Dr. Sharon, who's our center director, has said this multiple times um, and really was driving this point home when, the initi when they initiated this uh, activity and effort. Compliance is important. It really does establish your base of control, but it's not enough, right? How do we build that culture of quality? What we did was develop a pilot that really took the discussion of compliance off the table. We started with companies who were already compliant, that was a entry criteria into the pilot program. And we went and leveraged a different way to look at the organization. One focused on really driving improvement, exercising how well the quality system that was established was delivering for the patients and for the business, because I think that is a key piece that we keep uh, neglecting. The idea of quality should bring value primarily to your customers, to those patients, um, but secondarily to the business. So what we established was a uh, program where our manufacturers will go through a maturity appraisal. Um, this one, we particularly chose the SEMA mind model and there was a, an effort to really evaluate several of the different types of excellence appraisals, different types of excellence models that are out there. And we settled on SEMA mind because of its flexibility and granularity. Um, it gave us a lot of insight plus a roadmap to really help drive an understanding of where an organization actually was and what were the stages it could take in order to drive improvement. The manufacturer will go through that part, that uh, appraisal. The manufacturer then commits to these quarterly checkpoints and submitting quarterly metrics. This is a, a key piece to helping drive those connections in a more objective results uh, driven fashion. So the focus isn't always on inspecting the outputs. It's what are those outputs intended to deliver? What's the result that they accomplish? And focusing on how that is uh, paid attention to, how is that measured, how is that managed? In order to um, to really support this, and this is something that we learned as we were engaging with our stakeholders, when we actually went out and started talking to manufacturers, really going on site and understanding what was the impact of some of the oversight activities, we needed to change 
the way we did things in order to really spur that process of continuous improvement and accelerate changes and uh, ado uh, really adoption of the program within the culture of the organization that was participating. One of the things that we learned early on, you know, was the idea that inspections, and this is something that I think we've also learned from just benchmarking outside the uh, medical device industry. You know, inspections are disruptive. They are disruptive to the quality operation. Um, they have a role, but it really should be a focused role uh, when necessary. So one of the things that we decided to do early on was to shift for companies who are participating in the pilot, the need for certain types of inspections. Uh, we've got that established. We've got other mechanisms such as an MD staff audit that establishes the maintenance of compliance. We've already reviewed the system from a compliance standpoint with an FDA inspection. What we want to do is focus on driving better connection and better uh, interaction between that system. So we're not asking then afterwards for those who are participating and really being a lot more transparent and engaged with their data uh, for additional uh, inspections to go through the process. We still retain the right to do a four cause inspection. We will still respond to a safety signal if there is one out there. So that's always within the purview of the pilot in the program, but it will be more focused and it will be targeted to resolution of the problem versus, you know, just trying to, to find out where you went and where the organization was in a non-compliant state. Um, changes from a review standpoint that we made. So one of the things that was a big limiting factor for the pilot that we delivered was the idea of the 30 day change notices taking oftentimes 30 days for a company to just put together a regulatory package, 30 days for us as an agency to review. Um, in addition to that, the oftentimes the organizations might not even have the regulatory resources to put behind putting together change notices and that actually stifled the ability to implement what were probably optimum changes um, or better solutions uh, whenever a process needed to be improved or issues were encountered. So we developed a very streamlined submission and we committed to reducing the review time from 30 days down to five. We also did the same thing for other manufacturing related submissions, right? Really trying to bring these, uh, these changes down to a reasonable time frame. Manufacturing site changes, which are 180 day, 180 day supplements, we set an aggressive target um, and found that we can come close, but it's, it's too aggressive. So we're probably going to be in the 20 day business day review time frame, and then waiving some other pre approval inspections, streamlining the review to focus really on what's relevant for the product and safety of it versus a lot of what is in the submission for uh, activities now. So what has this done for, I think, what we've learned throughout the course of the pilot? First of all, it actually has enabled us to move away from just this kind of whack-a-mole uh, compliance mentality where we go into a site, find out if it's bad, find out if it's good, move on to the next site, and so on and so forth. Um, the granularity of what we get from the maturity appraisal and you'll see that spider chart on the side um, actually shows the 11 of the 22, I think it's 23 practice areas now that we chose for the pilot. And we chose those specifically because of their, um, of their relevance to the manufacturing activities that we were looking to evaluate. You can see larger trends across the industry. You can see how organizations are performing and benchmark against each other. Um, we found that in a lot of cases that there were some systemic issues across the whole med device industry that were just the result of oftentimes siloing that was occurring in order to respond to how audits were done or performed. Um, we found that over time, the industry as a whole had driven a, um, their capital system to be more about just documenting the effort for the regulator than actually adding value to the system. So that allowed us to kick off broader initiatives uh, over the last year to really reset the dynamic around that. These practices, these act efforts really are intended to be about driving that improvement, that control 
that's a statement within an organization. They're not meant to be about the regulator. And we needed to really reset that focus. So um, that has a much broader impact than us individually going and seeing what's happening company for company. The added focus and the actual value focus of the appraisals has actually allowed the quality organizations to speak a bit more of the business language and really re-engage the, um, the C-suite. So there's been a lot more support for driving some of the improvements, getting some of that value out. Uh, I think the idea that quality is your, your, your value source um, has been able to re restart it. We've been hearing that more recently uh, with several of our participating companies who have been sharing their experiences and they've gone on panels with us and while some of these benefits were great, they're enticing, they do have some value. Not every change brings a significant value, but the improvements themselves, what the organizations are actually getting as a result of um, driving to some of the higher maturity practices, but knowing where to focus their time and attention right now is actually providing a lot more value than any of the incentives that we are offering. From our standpoint, um, the changes that we implemented in order to uh, enable the five-day review has actually provided us with a lot more insight. We've structured the information set coming in a bit more. It is a lot more data-driven. Um, we can actually now see trends. We provide a lot more traceability than what we used to have with regards to the changes, how they were being implemented, what products they were affecting, which sites they were being implemented in. Um, the types of changes that most manufacturers were going on, which actually gives insight into even where the maturity of the processes are for the product. So it's been a, um, I think a, we knew that there would be some benefits to some of this activity as we changed the, the focus of the submissions, but there's been a lot more insight than we I think could have anticipated or predicted. What do we have for, an impact standpoint. So this is just, again, based on even the traceability of what we can get through our submission notices, some of the report outs that the participating companies have been sharing with us. You know, we've got several of the manufacturing changes, um, the fact that we were able to reduce on average the um, uh, approval time frame for those or the acceptance time frame. Um, we saw more implementations of uh, just straight manufacturing and quality improvements, adoption and implementation of new technology to improve the processes. Um, in some cases, we saw organizations uh, really ramp up and build up their capacity. Uh, we were able to use the traceability of some of the product uh, UDI activity, uh, the product UDIs to really trace <laughs> uh, new treatments. Um, the types of changes, you know, that were happening, improved traceability, capacity. There is a value to some of the changes. They, we've seen organizations report everything from this change, you know, save the company X amount, $15,000 to, in one case, it actually made the company several million dollars. So it's been a, um, an exceedingly exciting learning experience for us as to what that means. Um, and the impact it might have for patients. Uh, for manufacturers, the, it's just improved um, consistency, ex improved expectations from, I think, the agency standpoint, better focus with regards to improvement activities. Several of them have just re really reported big overall organizational cultural changes now that they can actually improve things at a much faster rate, improved capacity, Again, the value propositions of quality, you know, cost reduction, less disruptions in systems. And from an FDA standpoint, um, better resource utilization. I will say that, you know, the, the crunch to get these things done in five days was a bit of a strain and it still is in some of the review divisions that are not fully staffed up. But as the people get comfortable with the submission change, the modifications, and the insights that it delivers instead, and looking at it from that fashion, um, we start to gain a lot more economies of uh, improvement on our end and really resource use. 
we've seen manufacturers really sharing best practices, which was something that we didn't think would be a um, a situation that would occur. We thought that the competitive nature would drive a lot of secrecy, but on the contrary, and this is something that has been initiated on their own, companies are sharing amongst themselves. Everybody's got the same goal. They all want a better patient outcome. You know, the way to get there isn't how they are competing. It's all that implementation behind it. That's their secret sauce, and that's that's fine for them to keep. Um, I think we're seeing a lot better resource utilization from our inspection resources also. And again, the idea of just more systemic improvements going on at an organization than I think we've been able to gauge or measure beforehand has been a huge opportunity from an FDA standpoint. Where are we going next? So we've done this and we've been going with this pilot for a couple of years now and it's been successful, but we really did carve out only uh, compliance sites. We really did a self-selection of companies who were already trying to, to get kickstarted on this journey. Uh, there's a big value to taking a lot of the principles and learning, you know, adding some additional um, criteria, controls that we'd like to see that we've actually picked up and learned from throughout the pilot and testing this out with non-compliant sites. So over the course of this year with MDIC and then that stakeholder community, we'll be developing uh, and testing out a variation of the same program that is now going to be applied to non-compliant sites. We are looking to get a better assessment of the implementation and use of advanced manufacturing practices and technologies within the device space. The idea of, I think people always toy around with it outside the industry 4.0 where a lot of the data and um, production and what's going on is really driven by the information and the capability that technology enables. Uh, how do we enable, how do we really drive more adoption of that uh, within the MED device space? So that's something that we're trying to get a better handle of this year. And I think with that collaboration, there's always been the push also uh, for cybersecurity. So we're trying to build out um, a threat modeling playbook and boot camps that would be available for manufacturers in the space. With regards to the pilot program that we actually have been running, it will still be running in operation and the goal is to create and transition that into an operational program this year. So the successes that we've had up until now um, have really uh, enabled us to get support from our congressional bodies and we did get a actual budget authority and allocation specifically to establish and build out this program into an operational uh, system. So we've been working on, you know, a governance committee that charters drafted. We're trying to establish a trusted third party to be able to engage and, and manage the intake and flow of information. Um, and then the goal for the agency here is to really develop and announce our formal program proposal uh, by the end of 2020. The other piece of this that is uh, a key component um, really goes back to better information, really, the analytics behind this. How do we know the product is doing what it's doing? How do the manufacturers know? How do we learn collectively about um, processes, what's happening, how the product is performing, the quality of the devices, so that we can actually be, even in the onset, a lot more responsive to issues, because there will always be issues, but in the future, you know, with enough information, enough data, the right focus is, can we even get to the point where we are predictive? And we are leveraging a lot of learning and uh, engagement from a similar program that exists uh, within the aerospace industry for really trying to get ahead of uh, certain types of problems and prevent them before they occur. So we are working with MITRE to actually develop this medical device information knowledge sharing platform. Um, the goal there is the data and information is to be used for really safety and improvement, not a, an enforcement strategy. The plan is to really have a developing working prototype, develop a working prototype that will deliver some value within the 2020 timeframe for that. But it is a critical bookend 
to, I think, a lot of this effort and the shift that we want to really move towards to being a lot more agile as a regulatory body. So here's a little bit of what that future vision might look like. Uh, again, this is all in development. Of course, this year, there are going to be constant spot of operations that will be um, really to put out publicly and displayed as part of our commitment this year. And this is not a, a system or an effort that is going to be just FDA or just industry. It really is going to take a lot of collaboration. Um, the goal is to continue the same engagements that we have had up until now because there is responsibility and there's a piece of ownership throughout the whole medical device ecosystem um, that we really want to make sure we empower people to, to take ownership of and act on. So this is going to be a, a significant effort um, over the course of this year to even just get this initiated. But afterwards, it will be something that we want to make sure continues that level of engagement because we've seen a lot of success through that um, collaboration over the course of the last couple of years with the pilot. I think with that, I am ready to take some questions if there are any. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Cisco. That was um, fascinating. I've got um, so many, uh, so many questions. Um, I'd like to uh, begin with um, a question about culture. Um, the My, my view is that, that um, the the whole uh, secret to success of of, um, of a quality system is organizational culture and signing on and committing to that. Um, how much cultural change did you see this bring about at, at that sort of softer level in the organization that you worked with? Honestly, one of the, aside from the few changes where there was actual monetary value, um, the biggest impact and the biggest, uh, I think, report out that we heard from participating companies has been in that cultural change. Um, organizations feeling like they are free to actually pursue um, driving more significant changes when their quality system and engaging their staff more with regards to what is the right thing to be doing versus just putting together a list of procedures and then in enforcing that staff is following it. Um, that's one of the main focuses that we were really trying to get at, because I think, as you stated just now, it's one of the biggest factors. It is a huge impact. It's really the driver, but it's exceedingly difficult to measure. Um, so we really were looking to get at what are the practices, the our activities that you would see ongoing, the behaviors that um, would be demonstrated for organizations where that culture shift or that culture is starting to be re-engaged. And that's where we really leverage a lot of what the CMI appraisal model can actually get at and assess. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, can I ask you a favor and to turn my video back on because you you have control of the webinar. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, the the um, there we go. I should be able to. Not yet, but anyway, we'll figure that out in a moment. Um, let's take some questions from from our audience. Um, uh, um, I have a question here from um, uh, from John, who says, um, "Oh, he, you know, he's obviously impressed. He says, if a company wants to participate, what are you looking for in accepting and selecting a company into this, and how does he apply? Um, what do you have to? Who do you contact, and, and any preparation required? Are, are you inducting new new um, participants? So we are. We are still accepting, and we are." Um actively enrolling participants at the very least until we hit a, a capacity limit to that. There is a, um, the criteria there is that, you know, you really have to have at least whether it is verified through NDSAP or through an FDA inspection, a, um, a compliant uh, audit at the site, because we are doing this by site, not by large corporate bodies. Now we can do multi-site appraisals within that, um, but, the efforts for enrolling and if people are interested i can send a make available a link uh sheet that has 
where you can go and what you need to do to be able to enroll. But if you need to at the moment and just go to mdic.org and just look up under case for quality, that should provide you all the resources there to be able to, um, to really so apply and enroll. mdic.org. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll get that uh, crib sheet from you anyway. We'll circulate that to all the attendees afterwards just so that people Perfect. Can but mdic.org. So I hope that answers your question, John, and, and um, maybe you can get enrolled. Um, another question from um, uh, from uh, David, who says, um, will this initiative also be rolled out to the pharma industry? You're in so I think the pharma, if people have been um, really looking at it uh, today, they actually are looking at and engaging in several initiatives to try to um, follow a similar path. I think we're still meeting their needs and their resources. So we do have several companies who are both pharma and med devices who are participating and they are leveraging the learnings that they've got uh, and they're getting here and applying it even in their pharma spaces. I think they are making themselves available uh, for the um, CEDAR sites in order in the CEDAR oversight body to just learn from if they'd like to, to grow. But you know, this particular version and this particular variant may not be the one that applies and gets applied in the pharma space. Mm -hmm. okay. But there is interest, there is efforts going on there. They're just going to be uh, different based on their needs. So watch watch this space, the pharma. Okay, thank you. Um, also, I think you might want to try the video now and see if you can actually. All right, let's on. see if we can, yeah. There we go. I'm back on. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, other questions. Let me see. Um, uh, we have a question here from Luis, which says, what are the biggest objections you've encountered from organizations this program? What are their fears? What makes people uncomfortable? One is it's still a pilot, so it's not an official program. So what happens um, if the sudden change in administration, if the change in direction shifts and it goes away, right? Uh, the engagement is very different with organizations that have been participating. Um, you know, the fear is that, that throwing them back into a compliance mindset really uh, disrupt anything that they've started on their way and set them up and expose them to a compliance risk. So that's one, and that's one that we really are looking to try to tackle throughout the course of this year by announcing the formal program. Um, the other one is, a lot of what we've modified and changed from our regulatory oversight activities is focused on uh, manufacturing and the submissions that we are really accelerating are of high value for people in the PMA space. Um, the companies who are primarily 510K, although we've got several companies in the pilot which is 510K and are receiving a lot of value from the improvements themselves, are waiting to see if there is anything that we will be doing to extend the, um, the modification to that product base, which is in the plan and goal. And we were actually um, working on some of that before we actually got the budget authority and the funding um, to set up the program. When that actually happened, that kind of accelerated our, our need to, to get that up and running. So it's been the focus and will be the focus until it gets announced and then we will build up the add-ons that we had originally started after that. But that is a, a big deal for some participating, participating companies. And I think the last piece is, um, are we getting to some of the other areas that organizations really want to improve or drive improvement in, which is in the design activities and design efforts or the supplier management pieces, which wasn't in scope for the original pilot, but has been added slowly in some of the participants up until now. Good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, another question um, um, is, um, are there any thoughts for collaborating with other regulatory bodies? You talked about trusted third parties. Um, you, you, is this something you could work with other regulators on in doing this? I, I think there is something that we are always entirely open to working with other regulators on. Um, we hadn't reached out or done anything more proactively because we just wanted to make sure we had a data set, right? There were some hypotheses or some things that we were testing first. Um, with the data that we've been getting and the engagement we've been getting up until now, I think it's worth 
saying that we've got something to be able to bring to the table if they, this works and there's room for it within the, the paradigm of things that um, goes on right now across all the regulatory bodies. Now, I could tell you that we are, uh, at least from an MD-SAP standpoint and their connection to the other regulatory bodies, we are engaged with our internal team that is part of that effort. And, um, you know, they're learning from us, we're learning from them where possible. As we keep progressing, wherever we can find some ways to converge, um, that'll be obviously our, our primary goal. Good, good, good. Thank you. Um, another question, uh, John's come back with a supplementary. Um, if a company's had a 483 in the past for corrective and preventive yep. action, does that impact ability to take part? No. So we're looking to the point where that 483 wasn't addressed. So 43s, um, you know, they are an observation made by the uh, investigator. Um, if it's not been turned into an actual citation that's listed in a warning letter where you are declared to be non-compliant in an official action state, um, they are, you know, the closest thing from a regulatory authority that we've got right now to feedback from the agency. And that's how they really should be taken in, in terms of addressing things. That having a 43 does not prevent you from participating in a pilot, does not prevent you from participating in the program. Having a warning letter or other um, compliant activity right now does until we build out the other pilot. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Understand that. Um, I was struck by one thing on one, of, one on your slide. You had a program which you referred to in passing, um, and I'll follow on from 483. 483 is, of course, about corrective actions. You talked about something called Make Kappa Cool. Tell me more about Make Kappa Cool, please. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, um, this actually came out. Uh, one of the things that we did for um, you know, just provide some safe space for participants within the pilot uh, in order to get some learning. We really were talking about improvement and improvement is all about them as an organization. They should be able to prioritize what it is that is important, what they need to do, what systemic activities they're going to take on. And we've seen actually that some of that prioritization has driven improvement in a lot of the other areas that uh, were even um, identified through the appraisal. But when we were looking at these high level aggregates, we kept seeing dips in certain practice areas across the entire industry. Uh, the model has a lot more granularity to it than what we collect from an agency standpoint. What we do with that granular data is we have the Institute, CMI, actually aggregated across all the participants, um, the identified, and we can now see in real depth detail if there's any areas or, or struggle points. Well, when we looked in depth and we saw where practice levels are really starting to fall out in those areas, they were related to a lot of the activities that you would see or a lot of the behaviors you would expect to see with an organization that's really focused on that problem solving, that resolution. What are the support structures around that piece? And when we decided to dig into the industry to find out what was going on, the recurring hurdle was Kappa. Kappa is a burdensome. Kappa take a long time. Um, favorite initiation and why it turned into the Make Kappa Cool activity was, you know, uh, uh, Luann Pendy from Medtronic was uh, the sponsor for this activity when it initiated. Put it up on a nice chart. He said, you know, she's got a slew of engineers, all who love solving problems, they all hate a Kappa. And that's not what the intent of that was. So, you know, the idea of the Make Kappa Cool really arose from that. It was, we really want that to be a system that is value added for problem solving. We want to get people more engaged in problem solving. We want that behavior, we want that effort to be rewarded. We want the issues caught before they get out. Um, and if the system is adding too much overhead or too much burden to that process or to that effort or to that behavior, we need to relook and reassess as, uh, that system. And that's where that came from. The title, which is a very clever title that I think uh, Luann came up with when she initiated and kicked off the project team. <laughs> Only a bunch of quality guys could make up a cool, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, let, let's um, just two questions really following on from that. Um, firstly, uh, again, talking about culture, you know, um, this culture of, of, of this is worth doing and so on. Um, 
you talked about the cultural change in the participants in the manufacturing participants has this driven a cultural change in the auditing team from fda side so actually that is it's going to be a slow process for a couple of reasons um resources right they as you saw the 21,000 international sites that we've got uh, we've got in our 21,000 both domestic and, manuf and international manufacturers that are in our, our registry. Um, that's the responsibility of less than a couple hundred people, basically, to get out there and do those mm -hmm. audits. Um, so that is a resource burned for them. Now, they are actively uh, engaged um, and, and just observing what's going on through the pilot. What we have started doing is starting to bring the mindset some of the appraisal training sending some of our auditors out to have the cmi appraisal training um, trying to get them onto some site visits with the manufacturers who have engaged participating so that that shift will start to happen and some of the time and oftentimes when they go and experience it you see the aha you see the click um, it's going to take time because they aren't authorized basically by our, our regs to be able to do something different or engage in a very different format. Um, but I think there is a willingness there. And really part of the reason we went with an appraisal model was based off of early feedback when on the onset of case for quality, when we actually polled our medical device inspectors and found that one of the biggest things that they wanted to be able to do that they do not have the authority to do and cannot do right now is to be able to advise without it being seen as a penalty. Hmm. Um, so the willingness is there. I think this gives them an extra tool to be able to do that. It's going to take time to, to build that into the structure and system. And, and uh, interestingly, uh, FDA is, uh, is um, I know, edging its way towards a transition from uh, CFR 820 over to ISO 13485, and I'm not going to talk in detail about what the timetable is for that, but do you think that might also provide opportunities for opening things out when you're moving to a slightly different audit model? Oh, absolutely. I think um, the one thing that's beneficial about the, um, the CMI appraisal methodology is that it's agnostic to what is your underlying regulatory or, com or quality system. Right. So if it's 820, if it's 1345, it doesn't care because it doesn't establish your quality system for you. It evaluates how well is it executing and are there opportunities to, to make it more effective and efficient. Um, but what they do do is they have, a as part of the appraisal methodology, a lot more allowance for that, I guess, observation of good critical thinking and good risk approaches to how the work is being done. And I think 1345 is a lot more explicit in, uh, I think, integrating that risk thinking throughout all of its activities and processes. So I think that transition will align really nicely with even the what the appraisal can observe and what they're really geared to do. Interesting, interesting. Um, a quick question from Helen, um, just a procedural one here. She asks, um, uh, can we get the categories that you were measuring? There was a table in the early part of the slide deck where it was full of abbreviations of the actual things that were measured. Is that something? Oh, yes, absolutely. You some further information yeah. on? Okay, Helen, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll work with Cisco to get that included in the, the stuff we saw. And I, I can actually also, when I provide the, I'll send you the list of um, links and I'll attach also a copy of the pilot appraisal report, there's a lot more depth and detail of what those categories are and why we selected them, what went on in there. Okay, so we'll get all of that sent around afterwards. We'll make yep. it That's great. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> now, um, coming back to uh, measurement of, of, um, uh, of the outcomes, um, uh, James asked the question, how does FDA measure success in terms of patient outcomes? Yeah. Uh, so I'll ask you to speak that, but then I'm going to ask you to talk about corporate outcomes and the influence that might have on, you know, the C-suite, those that normally see quality as a cost center rather than a value driver. Let's talk about patients first. So with the patient one, so what we've tried to do with this, and we do know that's our, I think, 
universally the holy grail everybody's trying to get at, right? If you can really tie in certain activities, certain practices, certain measures here to a patient outcome, beautiful. But the, that's a, a very complex system to try to get into there. Um, what we've tried to do with regards to some of these practices and behaviors is to be at least focused on more measurement and results driven with regards to just the implementation of the quality system, what it's looking to, to drive. Um, the current model of any regulatory body or any regulatory system really sets out a set of requirements that organizations have to follow with the kind of implicit understanding that if you are meeting those requirements, there's a higher probability that you're going to produce a safe and effective medical device. Um, what we've tried to do is take that premise and really focus it on the measurable from that, not just the output of meeting the requirements, but what's the result of that it's really looking to deliver from an organization standpoint. Um, the goal there is if you're obviously making anything better, measuring that in any way um, to show improvements in that, you should be driving improvements that will impact the patient down the road. We've had some fortune with regards to products that are in the pilot space where there is that, um, that UDI requirement and we can actually get more traceability down to the patient. Um, but that's not a, a really common occurrence across every product activity. And it's only been in cases where there is an equivalent patient, for example, outcome portal, registry, or system established that would allow us to get that. So we've proven out that there's a way to, to trace things down to that degree, but making it more systemic, making it universal is one of the big goals. It's, it's really why we want to try to enable that more analysis and analytics focus is to be able to try to get integration of that additional information as we move down downstream. But one of the things that we can try to do, you know, while we still get to that point is just get better about the data that manufacturers are already using, what they are aware of, um, you know, to the degree that it leaves their hands, right? Because then you get all the pieces of the healthcare chain that introduce their own variables and that we haven't figured out how to incorporate that. So that's how we're trying to get to the outcomes, but that's going to be a, a long process. Um, there's other efforts that the agency is doing, such as NEST, that are geared towards um, to try to get to that other bookend of what's happening with the patients. And we're trying to enable, you know, the, the first piece of that um, from yeah. the product down to the patient piece. I, I guess it's difficult um, to measure it. It's, it's, it's sort of at one remove because um, you're dealing with what's going on in the in the manufacturing side, um, when the device right. is in the clinic. Um, so I guess um, you would see metrics of, you know, changes in, in quality incidents, changes in adverse events, changes in, in um, you know, post-market um, act, actions and so on, which you might be able to measure at a fairly crude level um, before and after somebody's in this kind of program. But but I do uh, right. understand the challenge. Um, but let's now turn to, you know, uh, that question about quality as a cost center compared to quality yeah. as a value driver. Um, uh, what I really like about this is, is uh, I saw some of those numbers, you know, um, uh, 21 days faster to implement a production change. And then there were some substantial cost savings, which you seem to have managed to quantify. Um, that's really important information to, to convince uh, those who, who hold the purse strings that the quality is, is worth investing in. I think that is um, originally where this, you know, when, when FDA really kicked this all off and issued a white paper, it was originally called the business case for quality, right? Um, because the idea or the thinking was that we had to work and help to, to develop a way for organizations to understand that quality should be a, a value proposition. Um, I think, you know, that was a little bit presumptuous early on in our part because in reality, most companies understand that you build a good product, it's good for business. <laughs> um, what we needed to, to really reset and why it kind of resets it just in case for quality is um, all the pieces of that stream needed to be able to make their adjustments in order to, to improve the product quality. But the portion of this 
is no longer being seen from an organizational standpoint as the the police, right? The uh, the organization that always tells them no, or the organization that says, you know, here's where your risk is, and um, no actual other solution. It's being turned now from that piece to the organization that people are turning to to say, hey, you know, we need to implement something like this. We need to drive this much of a value offset. How do we do that? And organizations are now saying, well, we can deliver that to you through participation here with just these types of implementations and these changes and getting through that faster. So we're seeing a lot more of that happening um, very quickly at some of these companies. Um, you know, we always knew that the question came to who is in charge of the organization. They have that mindset and do they drive that, that kind of cultural focus all the way down. Um, I think a lot of companies, and it doesn't matter, you know, if you've got a CEO who's got that background, that mindset, that is obviously a great accelerator. But even if you don't, if you've got a CEO who is understanding of what's good for the customer and good for the business, you can show them the data and that's what they would focus on. And a lot of the approvals have been a lot faster and easier to implement um, once they start to, to turn things around. We learned a lot of that from engaging and bringing in uh, companies from outside the med device space. I think we had Toyota present at one of our MDIC forums, Dell present at one of our forums. And, you know, they don't speak in terms of what's the potential cost of a recall, the potential cost of this, the potential cost of this. It's always the value that this is driving by improving this process or the value that this is giving us by improving this activity. And that was a bit of a, a turning point too in terms of the mindset shift we needed to, yes. to really focus on driving. So it's bringing uh, reduced costs, greater speed, better product, all good for business. Okay, <laughs> well, we're coming up to the end of our time. Um, I'd like to, um, to wrap up if I may. I've, I've learned a great deal today. Um, um, uh, and uh, the idea of make Kappa cool was just made my morning. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, Cisco. That's a big interest for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Th thank you so much for what's been a, an intriguing presentation. Um, we will um, uh, get slides from you. We'll, we've recorded this uh, webinar, so we'll make that available to everybody who's registered. Um, it's all going to be on our website. Um, uh, thank you for the audience for the many questions um, and those that sending questions in advance. Um, and I hope you've um, you've also uh, found this as as, uh, as fascinating and, and valuable as I have. Um, we'll be back. Uh, we're not doing a, a webinar directly uh, next month because it's right on top of Christmas. We'll be back in the new year. Um, and um, and thank you, John, who's just come through with another comment and said thanks for a great webinar. So there you are. <laughs> I think you have a fan. <laughs> um, uh, and. Uh, <laughs> We, we, uh, we'll we'll um, come back soon. So thanks again. Thank you, Cisco. And um, good day from Sydney. Uh, thank you. Uh, good evening in, in the US and wherever you are. I know we've got people all around the world on this webinar. Thanks again. Bye now. Thank you.